Thanks to World of Warships for sponsoring this video. Did you know that a notorious criminal actually released an album over 50 years ago? The 1970s were a pivotal time for music. Between the birth of heavy metal in 1970 and the development of many new subgenres under both the rock and metal umbrellas, it's a period of music history that we seem to take for granted now. In this video, we're going to dive into some of the most shocking moments that happened within the rock and metal world throughout the 1970s, so keep watching to see what music fans were hearing on the news around five decades ago. It was a wild time. The Beatles broke up and they each went off in their own directions. The deaths of Jimi Hendrix, Janis Joplin, and Jim Morrison at the ages of 27, just a few months apart from each other, spawned the concept of the 27 Club. Elvis Presley died, though the conditions were left a mystery for a long time. These are some of the things you may already know about, so we're going to dive deeper. After 12 studio albums, the Beatles publicly broke up in 1970, but it was only one member who actually confirmed it. Paul McCartney had started working on solo material in 1969 while the band was still together, and in a 1970 interview promoting the solo effort, he said that the Beatles were done, saying, Time will tell. Being a solo album means it's the start of a solo career, and not being done with the Beatles means it's just a rest. So it's both. Temporary or permanent? I don't know. John Lennon said shortly after, The Beatles haven't had a future for me for the last two years. All of us are laboring under this delusion about Beatles and McCartney and Lennon and Harrison and Starr. But, you know, we all have to get over it. Us and the public. It's a joke. What we did was what we did, but what we are is something different. And each Beatle went his own way from there. I wanted to start with the Beatles because they were so influential for so many rock and metal bands that came after them, including Megadeth frontman Dave Mustaine, who cited the White Album as having a big impact on his own songwriting later on. And speaking of Megadeth, did you know that there's a PC game that Megadeth partnered with a few months ago called World of Warships? It's completely free to play and features ships based on actual historical war vessels led by some of the most iconic commanders to have ever lived. The game has amazing graphics and releases new content every month including new ships, in-game nations, and more, keeping gameplay fresh and exciting at all times. The Megadeth bundle included commanders Dave Mustaine and Vic Rattlehead, and even featured voiceovers from the vocalist. In an interview, Mustaine praised the game for its ability to bring the metal and gaming communities together. And if he's a fan of the game, then I'm sure you will be too. Although that bundle is no longer available, from now until November 30th, World of Warships will feature an in-game collaboration with the anime series High School Fleet. Each of the commanders have their own voiceover and 10 skill points, and they all come in one bundle that'll be available in the premium shop. World of Warships isn't only available on PC though. You can also play it on Xbox, PlayStation, and even your phone. Download World of Warships using the link in the video description and use promo code HSF2023 to receive a huge starter pack that includes 200 doubloons, 1 million credits, a full 7 days of premium account time, and 2 high school fleet commanders. Again, click the link in our video description and use code HSF2023 when you download World of Warships. Now back to the 70s. Charles Manson was a notorious cult leader who led a group of people, which came to be known as the Manson family, in the late 1960s and early 70s. Though the family committed several murders, they were most notorious for the murder of actress Sharon Tate, who was pregnant at the time, some individuals that were at her residence, and then Leno and Rosemary LaBianca the following night. Dubbed the Tate-LaBianca murders, these gruesome acts weren't carried out by Manson himself, but were directed by him. Eventually, officials found that he was responsible for the actions of the family, and he and the members were put on trial in 1970. What many people don't know about Manson is that he was also an aspiring musician. He had recorded a collection of songs in 1967 and 68, and while on trial, he called producer Phil Kaufman and asked him to release the music. According to a 1970 column by Mike John, Kaufman said, when he was conducting his own defense, he was only allowed three phone calls a day. He used to call me every day, five days a week. He was very anxious for his music to be heard. Thus, his debut album, Lie, The Love and Terror Cult, was released on March 6, 1970. Billboard notes that he used the profits to pay for his defense during the murder trial. It's a little disturbing to think that someone facing such horrific charges was given an opportunity to share their music but the world was really different 50 years ago. You might have even heard some of the songs too. Guns N' Roses later covered one of the songs from the album called Look At Your Game Girl for the Spaghetti Incident, and the Beach Boys had rewritten Cease to Exist as Never Learn Not to Love for their 1969 album 2020. 
Led Zeppelin were on top of the world in the mid-70s, but a horrible car accident in 1975 began a series of tragic events for frontman Robert Plant. The singer, his wife Maureen Wilson, their seven-year-old daughter Carmen, and four-year-old son Carrick were hospitalized after getting in a serious collision in Greece. The band issued a press release about the accident, which read, Due to the nature and extent of the injuries sustained by Plant and his family, and the inadequate medical facilities and roads, a member of the London staff of Swansong, Led Zeppelin's record company, flew to Rhodes in a chartered jet equipped with stretchers, blood plasma, and two doctors from Harley St. England's finest medical center. Plant and his family all sustained multiple fractures, but Wilson was in the worst condition, having also suffered concussions and facial lacerations. Two years after the accident, Plant's son Carrick died from a stomach virus. He was five years old. Led Zeppelin were on tour at the time and were in New Orleans when the frontman received a series of phone calls from his wife. As their tour manager, Richard Cole, recalled, the first phone call said his son was sick, and the second phone call, unfortunately, Carrick had died in that time. Led Zeppelin immediately canceled their tour and Plant returned home to his family, and it almost spelled the end of the band. Plant later told Rolling Stone, I lost my boy. I didn't want to be in Led Zeppelin. I wanted to be with my family. The in through the outdoor song, All My Love, was written about Carrick. Leonard Skinner had just released their fifth album, Street Survivors, and were on their way to Baton Rouge, Louisiana from Greenville, South Carolina, for a show when their plane ran out of fuel mid-flight. The pilots attempted to carry out an emergency landing in a nearby open field, but ultimately crashed into the trees below. Vocalist Ronnie Van Zant, guitarist Steve Gaines, backing vocalist Cassie Gaines, assistant road manager Dean Kilpatrick, and the two pilots, Walter McCreary and William John Gray, all died from the impact. A spokesman and sound technician for the group said that the plane had been in a rundown state and some of the members didn't want to fly on it to begin with. It was scheduled to be serviced in Baton Rouge, according to a New York Times article. The band's label pulled Street Survivors and replaced the cover as the original had a photo of the band members surrounded by flames on it. Black Sabbath, though hailed as the creators of heavy metal throughout the 70s, were in bad shape by the end of the decade. Their 1978 release, Never Say Die, was poorly received for the most part, and the members' substance abuse issues were getting out of control. They were in the midst of working on the album's follow-up, and Ozzy Osbourne, in particular, had become the most difficult of the bunch, behavior-wise. So, in April of 79, he was fired from the group. Guitarist Tony Iommi recalled in an interview, We just couldn't continue with Ozzy. As much as everyone wanted us to, we just couldn't do it. Nothing was happening, and it would have meant the the end of the band. Osborne wrote how betrayed he felt by his bandmates in his book, I Am Ozzy. We were four blokes who'd grown up together a few streets apart, he said. We were like family, like brothers. And firing me for being fucked up was hypocritical bullshit. We were all fucked up. The loss of Osborne didn't spell the end of Sabbath, though. Former Rainbow vocalist Ronnie James Dio replaced him shortly after the split, and they released two albums with him in the early 80s. It's no secret that the Who drummer Keith Moon had struggles with substance abuse during his lifetime. In 1978, he was prescribed clomethiazole to help with his alcohol withdrawal symptoms as he wanted to kick his dependency to alcohol on his own. However, the drug is addictive on its own if it isn't administered as instructed. The drummer and his girlfriend Annette Walter Lax attended a party thrown by Paul and Linda McCartney one night and then went to the premiere of the Buddy Holly story. After the couple returned home, Moon took some pills and went to bed, then woke up a few hours later and took some more. Walter Lax slept on the couch because the musician snored, and when she woke up and went to his bedroom, she found him dead in his bed. His cause of death was ruled as an accidental overdose on clomethiazole. He was 32 years old. One of the band's managers called Pete Townsend to deliver the tragic news, who then called the rest of their bandmates Roger Daltrey and John Entwistle. A year later, in late 1979, the Who were on their first tour since Moon's death with Kenny Jones behind the drums. For a band that had just endured such a tragedy, they couldn't have predicted what would happen the night of December 3rd in Cincinnati, Ohio. Thousands of fans rushed through the the doors of the Riverfront Coliseum venue, and 11 people were trampled to death in the rush. About 26 other people were injured during the stampede. Fire officials wanted the show to be canceled, but it was feared that more panic and danger would ensue. They decided to let the concert go on as planned, so the band wasn't made aware of the tragedy until after their performance. Townsend told WCPO Cincinnati in 2019, I remember feeling good about the show, and we came off stage, and Bill came in and said, I've got some really bad news to tell you, and started to explain it to us. And I went through two phases. One was, of course, tremendous upset and concern, but the other was incredible anger that we had been performing while this was going on. Townsend confessed that he regrets how the band handled the news as they left Cincinnati to make it to their next gig in Buffalo. 
They spent the night drinking, sobering up and drinking more to ease their sorrows, but the rockers said that they should have stayed in the city to mourn with its residents and loved ones of the victims. As you can see, the 70s were a really pivotal time in rock and roll because of all the major changes that had taken place both within bands and within the genre itself. As the end of the decade neared, new subgenres of rock and metal began splintering off in different directions, which led to the rise of hundreds of new artists and bands. We lost a lot of key musicians in the 70s, and a lot of huge groups started to lose their way, which set the stage for a lot of chaos in the following years. To read more about the most shocking moments of the 70s, head over to loudwire.com. In the next video in this series, we'll look back on the most shocking moments of the 80s and how they impacted music forever.